title of this message is Debt, the Seed Thief. Debt, the Seed Thief. The idea of debt wasn't always the norm. But in our culture, we've become so desensitized to it that not only has it become normal to us, it's actually become comfortable. And that's scary. That debt has become a place of comfort for us is, is a scary thought. And it's, it, it's not just that comfort spot for a, few, for a few, but actually the majority, even in the church, that debt has become a, a place of comfort. <coughs> it's a place where we've grown to feel secure. And that's a very, very false sense of security. If, if we doubt this, all we have to do is look around. Look around. Look at, at people who have come into millions. Look at superstar athletes who have come into millions. Look at entertainers and, and that have come into millions. I'm millions, multi, hundreds of millions, some of them. And the next thing you know, they're having a benefit to help them pay for their debt. Because they're they're broke. Look at look at the prize fighters who've won hundreds of millions of dollars, and then when they're fifty something years old, go back into the ring for another fight to try to cash in on a little bit more to help get them out of debt. You see what I'm saying? It's a cycle that we get caught up in of debt. I, I know in in my life, in our lives, you know, I, I remember the day when. This, this whole living debt free thing, this is really new to me. It's something I'm really just, really just here in the last couple of years beginning to be able to believe God for and sink my teeth into. Because in our past, it was, we didn't have the faith to believe God to be out of debt. We had, you know, now that I was talking the other day, I said we only had faith to believe God that the loan would be approved. Right. <laughs> you know, I was just praying that we could get approved for a loan. Not that we'd be able to live out debt free. That's what God has for us. <clears throat> so if you look at the cycle that goes on, there's been times I can look back over our, our life together, Natalie and I, where we've come into money at different times. And, you know, the, the cycle was, okay, now what can we buy? We've got this money. What, can, what, can we, what are we going to do with it? What can we do with it? What can we buy? Because there were so many things that we just wanted. You know? It was almost like, this is an answer of prayer to be able to pay off the debt that we have so we can get more. You know what I mean? Okay, we can pay off the few little things that we owe so now we can afford to finance something else bigger. Am I the only one that's done this? Probably not. I want us to recognize that as a spirit that's at work in this world to bind the children of because that's exactly what debt does, is it binds our hands. It ties us. And we become so less effective than we could be when we were, we're, we're not in debt. Debt sets limits to how far we can obey God. Debt sets a limit as to how far we can obey God. You know, Natalie was just sharing about the covenant. And the covenant says... Everything you have, Lord, is mine. But everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. So if everything I have is belongs to God and nothing is mine anyway, like Abraham, when God spoke to him and told, told him to offer Isaac, like Nana said, he had no problem doing that because he understood the covenant. And he, he didn't even see that in his, as his son anyway. That was God's son because he had a covenant with God. So he had no problem offering it. So what if God speaks to me to give something like a vehicle or my home? What if? What if he does? But what if I'm in debt? And what if I can't? Because I owe on it. Because I can't say something to somebody, here, here's a gift from God. Oh, by the way, it comes with a note. 
that's not a gift. That's a curse. You want somebody to give you a gift that comes attached with a note? A monthly? No, that's no gift. When I gave Joshua his truck, he wouldn't have been nearly as excited as if I'd have said, him, given him a, a, you know, the book that your your vehicle notes in. But that would have came with the keys. He would not have been nearly as excited. So it sets a limit on how far we can obey God. It, it reminds me very much of the spirit of religion. You know, the spirit of religion. We talked about it. It, it chains us, and we're secured. And that chain is only so long then we hit the end of it because that's as far as our, our religious mind will allow us to think. That's as far as, as we can push the limit. And that's what debt does to us. It only allows us to believe God. It only allows us to be submitted to God so far. But we can't go any further than that because we hit all. Look at what debt has done and is doing through our government. Think there's not a spirit at work. You can look back. You can look back 40, 50 years and look what that spirit has done by working through our government, causing people to be indebted. There are people that is, and it's becoming a majority of our nation, totally indebted to our government. Now, what happens when you become totally dependent on anything? You're a slave. And you're nothing more. You're nothing more than a slave. And so that spirit's at work. And we see it, 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 it started with one generation, and it, it was a struggle for them. For that generation, it was probably, it was, well, I know it was a struggle for them to be, be dependent on the government. But for the next generation, it wasn't a struggle anymore. It was easy. Then for the next generation, not only is it easy, it's expected. You see the transformation? You see how that spirit took root? And it grows, and it multiplies from generation to generation. Now, we can, as children of God, we can have that same effect, but in the opposite. Well, how would God say, you'll be, your generations, your grandchildren will be blessed. To the third and the fourth generation. We can get our children in the mindset, our grandchildren in the mindset, to expect to live in the blessing. To expect to God, for God to be my provider? Man, my God can provide a whole lot better than my government can. Because there's no strings attached. All he wants is everything I have. That's no string, is it? <laughs> All he wants is everything I have. But I get everything he has, and that's quite a deal. That's quite a deal. Like Natalie said, you know, when when, a, when these villages or these tribes were in proximity, close proximity to each other, and you've got a big, powerful tribe over here, and you've got a little weak, scrawny one over here, well, that little weak one, all they wanted to do was get into a covenant with this strong tribe. Because now, they're entitled to everything they have. That represents the covenant we have with God. What do you have compared to God? What do you have compared to God? It's that willingness to give whatever. Whatever. Is it just the tithe this week, Lord? Or is it everything? Or is it anything in between? What the Lord showed me and what I'm trying to relate to you is how debt <coughs> restricts that. You can't give everything if you're in debt. Right? I can't give everything if I'm in debt, if I owe on it. How can I say everything I have is the Lord's and the bank's? That doesn't make any sense. It's either God's or it's theirs. I don't want it to be theirs. I want it to be his. Romans 13.8 says this. Owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves has fulfilled the law. You want to fulfill the whole law? Yeah. Don't owe anybody anything except to love them. What a liberation. What a liberation. The only debt you could ever have is to love somebody. Wow. Poverty is not a financial problem. It's a spiritual problem. Poverty is not a financial problem. It's a spiritual problem. To think kingdom, and that's what we should think, kingdom, as a child of God, 
as a citizen of the kingdom, we should always see money as seed. The only way to see money is seed. If we stop looking at it in what it has the potential to buy us and start seeing it just as seed, it starts becoming a whole lot easier just to sow. What kind of farmer wants his silos filled with seed that he never intends to put in the ground? But what do we do? We want our bank account to be to a certain level and don't have any intention of sowing it. You see? What a, what a waste. If you would look at a farmer who has his grain bins full of seed and his plate empty and say, you are a fool. But yet we see people with money in the bank and no crop growing in the field. Even if that farmer, look, look I'm going to paint this picture. All right, that farmer has a silo full of corn. Okay? He don't plant it in the ground. His field's full of weeds. But every evening at supper time, him and his family go and they start taking out of that, taking out of that bin. Then his neighbor down the road who he owes money to, he takes some more out of the bin and he brings it to him. And then the bank calls and he owes him, them something, so he brings them a bushel or two of corn. And he keeps keeps dipping into his bin. He keeps dipping into his bin. And he keeps dipping into his bin. But what happens to that bin? It comes, becomes empty. You see the principle? But if he had taken some of that, and he went out there in that field full of weeds, and he cleared that field and worked the ground and put that seed in the ground, he starts a reciprocating process he can pull out the bottom of the bin, but because of his crops are being filled, he's putting in the top, and he's pulling out the bottom, and he's putting in the top. As long as he keeps putting in the ground, he's putting in the in the in the. Right. But when he stops putting it in the ground, he stop he killed the ability to put it back into the silo. You see, you see. But if his debt is so big that it takes everything in his silo to pay, he can never put it in the ground. Debt is the thief of the seed. If we owe so much every month that we just live in just check to check to check and the check just pays the bills or sometimes it don't even quite pay the bills, nothing left to put in the ground. So now what did seed do? Oh, I'm sorry, what did debt do? It robbed you of your seed. When it robbed you of your seed, it robbed you of your harvest. Make sense? Since we see money as seed, we have to realize that we'll be accountable for every seed that we sow. For every dollar that we use. I really believe that. I really believe that. We're going to be accountable. <clears throat> when we come into debt, we take kingdom seed given to us by God, the provider of seed, that was meant to be re-sown into the kingdom, produce kingdom fruit, and we sow it into a Babylonian system or a world system that produces no fruit. I want to look at 2 Corinthians 9.10. It says, Now may he who supplies seed, he is capitalized, so that's God, right? Who pro provides seed to the sower, everybody say, I'm a sower. I'm a sower. And bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So what scripture says, God's going to give you seed. And if you sow it, he'll multiply it. If you eat it, he can't multiply it. Okay? If you owe it, he can't multiply it. I, I hear people say things like this. They just finance something. And they say, but we can afford it. We can afford the note. And I understand. You've got enough money left over at the end of the month to afford the note. But my question is, can you afford it? Can you really afford it? When you look at your money as seed, okay, so now you've got this new note, and that was seed with potential. Every seed has potential. The Bible says 30, 60, 100 fold, right? 
Every seed has potential, 36 and 100 fold. Now you've got potential of up to 100 fold that you could sow in the ground and reap a harvest, but now it's going into dead soil. So could you really afford it? In light of that, could you really afford it? Man, what I want to do, I want to look, I want to survey my life, and I want to find every penny that I'm putting in dead ground, and I want to stop that bleeding. And I want to put that somewhere where it's going to reap me a harvest. Because to me, I don't, I, man, I walk in my barn and I'll see horse feed that I pay good money for and I see a rat chewing on it. Yep. And that irks me. And to me, that's no different than paying a debt. That To me, that's no different than debt. Because it's something that could have been used to be profitable. Now something's eating, yeah. eating it that is never going to cause it to never produce me a harvest. Yep. Mm. So when we create new debt, we rob ourselves of the increased potential of our seed. Because see, that was seed that you could have sown that would have produced increase, would have produced a harvest. But now it's going into a Babylonian system that's dead. It's going into a world system that doesn't produce fruit. The systems of this world do not multiply. The kingdom of God multiplies. It, it's, it's, it's the basic sowing and reaping principle. So I want us, nobody to say anything, but to, just to survey our life and look at the percentage of the seed. We just read in 2 Corinthians that God is a provider of seed and he'll increase that that we sow into the ground. But I want us just to look at what percentage of the seed he gives us we sow into dead ground. It's kind of eye-opening when we look at it that way. I know it is for me. What percentage of what God, God says, here's a sack of seed. Now, in this sack of seed is potential for, you, for your provision. But what am I, because of the choices that I made, what am I forced to do with the seed that he gives me? Can I sow it like he wanted me to? What percentage of that sack of seed that he's given me do I have to give to an ungodly system? See? The story of the prodigal son, and we've talked about that I think three or four weeks in a row, who received a full inheritance from his father, and he had no debt when he left. But he took the seed that his father had given him and he sowed it into poor soil. And because there was no fruit, there was no increase, there was no fruit produced, he ran out. Right? And then he found himself just begging to eat what the hogs ate. He left with a whole sack of money. Seed. But because of where he chose to sow it, and it wasn't in ground that was fertile, he quickly ran out, just like I have done oh so many times. Have you ever seen yourself or other people into a sum of money and do just like that? Just like the prodigal son. Come in and and man, it's high living for a couple weeks, a couple months maybe, sometimes a couple years. But there's never sowing, there's never reaping. So it's not a perpetual thing. Every time that money enters our, enters our hand, we have to say, Lord, what is this? Where does it go? It's not mine. It's seed that you put in my hand. Now, what do you desire to do with it? What do you desire? We always have plans. We always have a plan. Because we always got that, that thing going on in our mind. Man, when I get rich, this is what I'm going to do. We all have a if I get rich plan, don't we? <laughs> But what we have to do is, Lord, you've put this in my hand because you have a desire for me to do something with it. So what is it? Where is it that I'm supposed to sow this? Is this, it said in 2 Corinthians, he provides seed for the sower and he also provides bread. Lord, is this seed that I'm going to sow? Is this bread that you want me to eat? We have to learn to distinguish seed from bread. God wants us to always be dependent on him. 
When we're set free of debt, we have to reappropriate the seed and sow it into the kingdom. How many times have I prayed and pleaded and God stepped in and then, man, I'm set free. I don't have to plead God anymore. God wants us to always be dependent on him. In every, in every area of our life, he wants us to be dependent on him. And that goes back to the story of the prodigal son. Once he received his inheritance, he didn't have to depend on his father anymore. Did he? He didn't have to depend on his daddy anymore. I'm free. I've been set free. I bet he was singing the whole way when he left with his sack full of money. But his life became a mess. He wasn't submitted to authority any longer. He didn't have to depend on anyone. And his life became a mess. Be dependent on the Lord. Be dependent on the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 The plan of God is reciprocation. Reciprocation. Give, receive. Give, receive. He gives, we receive. He gives, we receive. We give back, he multiplies and gives. We give back, he multiplies and gives. It's a reciprocating, reciprocating process. Forward and back. Forward and back. Forward and back. He gives, we give back. He multiplies, he gives. We give back, he multiplies, he gives. We give back, he multiplies, he gives. But what happens in our life, where the short comes in at, where the short circuit is, he gives, we give somewhere else. He gives, we don't give back. And it breaks the process. As long as we're giving, as long as we're giving to him, as long as we get, he gives back, and it's a, it's, a, it's a process that works flawlessly. The only way that chain is broken is when we fail to reciprocate back. We've all heard the scripture quoted, and I'm going to start it, and I want you to finish it. Train up a child the way he should go. When he is old, he will, he will not, not depart from, from it. See, we, we get the first part of that thought going right there, and we stop. And we use that scripture to comfort anyone who's got a wayward child. And, and that's fine. But what we have to do is read a little further. If we read the rest of that thought, you realize that scripture is talking about money? Proverbs 20, 22, 6 and 7. Listen to what it says. Listen like Paul already said the rest of the story. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. The rich rule over the poor. And the borrower is a servant to the lender. Did you ever notice that the scripture is talking about training a child in financial things? In, in financial affairs? It's talking about training your child on how to use money. It's about training your child and not becoming... Coming into debt. Pretty clear to me that the, the way it finishes out is the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a servant to the lender. Train up your child in what way? In this way. Not to be a borrower, but be a, to be a lender. Deuteronomy 5, 6. I'm sorry, 15, 6. For the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. You know how to get nations to reign over you? Borrow from them. You know how to get somebody to reign over you? Borrow from them. You know how to enslave yourself? Become a borrower. That's one of the things that one of the roads that our nation has taken that is just so detrimental to what this nation was founded on. We owe everybody huge sums of money that we may not ever be able to pay back. So what does that do to our authority in the world? You want to know what it does to our authority? Look at Russia. When we say, hey, you can't, they say, what, what do you mean we can't? Man, you owe us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. You don't have then you don't have any authority anymore. You say to these Middle Eastern nations, hey, stop it. 
You can't make a nuclear war, a nuclear bomb. They said, what do you, what do you mean? We'll listen to you when you pay us, pay us what you owe us. It takes all the authority away. And now where we should be in authority, in authority, we're under authority. It's not just the nation. It's in our homes. It's in our churches. We've become indebted to a Babylonian system, to a world system that God never intended us to shackle ourselves to. Most divorce is a result of financial hardship. Most stress is due to financial hardship. And when we talk about stress, then you're talking about heart failure. You're talking about cancers. You're talking about strokes. You're talking about nervous breakdowns. You're talking about all kind of psychological issues. You talk, all this that comes from stress. And where does it where does it come from usually? Financial trouble. That's where most stress comes from, right? Well, why is why are we in financial trouble? Because we become in debt. So if we weren't in debt, we wouldn't have financial trouble. If we didn't have financial trouble, we wouldn't have stress. If we didn't have stress, we wouldn't have hypertension and, and we wouldn't have strokes and we wouldn't have heart attacks and we wouldn't have certain cancers. And we it's this huge snowball. And then the whole time God said, I told you not to do that. Yeah. But thank God that He is merciful. Oh, yes. And He does for if He forgave me of a debt of sin. <laughs> He can forgive me for a few dollars. You know? If he forgave me from that debt, then I'd have never been able to pay. No man could pay my debt for sin. So if I trust him to pay that for me, how much easier is it for him to get me out of debt? A lot of alcoholism, I'd say most. Drug abuse, child abuse, domestic abuse, and so on and so on and so on is rooted in financial hardship that can be traced all the way back to debt. What I'm saying is this is a kingdom principle. It's the most basic of kingdom principles. It's the sowing, of, the sowing and reaping that we should all understand. Sowing and reaping is, is, is so easy to understand because we see it all around. The only way a seed grows if it's put if it's put in the ground. If it's sown in the fertile soil, it will grow. There's no doubt. But it has to be put in the ground. We say little we have our little cliches that we say in church, like you can't outgive God. But do we really believe it? But do we really believe it? I really believe this. If we really believed it, we would be trying. If any of us knew somebody that worked on Wall Street and they called us up and they said, man, I got an inside tip for you. And if you put your money in here, you're going to get a minimum of a 30-fold return. We would all be trying. We'd be scrounging every pink. We'd be flipping the couch cushions trying to find a nickel. <laughs> but the same promise comes from God. He's not a man that he should lie and we ignore it. God's desire for you is financial abundance. Because how else is he going to get the gospel to the nations? How else is he going to get the gospel out to the world if his children don't provide for it? If his children don't, don't finance it, how else is he going to do it? And over and over and over, he gives seed for us to sow. He gives seed for us to sow. He gives seed so we can produce a crop, so we can have a, an abundance, so we can send people out, so we can finance the evangelism of the world. Second Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having sufficiency for all things, may have an abundance for every good work. For every, an abundance for every good work. If we just believe that that scripture right there was true, and then if I reap bountifully, I'll harvest bountifully, and if I reap sparingly, I'll harvest sparingly, 
And God's desire for me is abundance, that scripture said. Amen. He said abundance for every good work. What is that good work? The promoting of the gospel. That's the good work. He said, I want you to be financially, live in financial abundance so you can finance my kingdom on earth. That's why I would never say God desires that we're all rich so we can kick back and live a life of leisure. That's, man, that's, that's a fallacy. It's preached, it's, but it's not true. God does desire that you live in abundance, but it's for the purpose of spreading his gospel. It's for the purpose of spreading the gospel. But you can live in abundance meantime. I would much rather live in abundance. I've lived seasons of abundance, and I've lived seasons of lack, and I can say abundance is better. Yes. I like it a whole lot more. But I have to be careful that in times of abundance, I have to be careful to not stop depending on God. I have to be attentive. That he is still my source in all things. And no matter what I have or what I don't have or what I want or what I already got, that's not my source. My source is God and God alone. And no matter what he blesses me with, I have to be willing to give every bit of it at, any, at the drop of a hat. Amen. No matter how much I like it. Abraham loved Isaac. But he was willing, like Natalie said, because he knew. He understood you can't outgive God. And if I give him my, even my son, he will raise him from the dead. So what I'm talking about is sowing seed. I'm talking about sowing seed. But get this. I'm not talking about the tithe. I'm not talking about the tithe. The tithe belongs to God. That's his already. Let me let, look. Let me let you in on a, on, a, on a truth about the tithe. You have two options with the tithe. You can do two things with it. One of two things. You can give it back or you can steal it. That's it. That's the only two things you can do with a tithe. You can give it back to God who says it's his anyway, or you can steal it. Here's the good thing about giving it back to God. You give God the tithe, the first 10%, guess what happens? Now you get to keep the other 90, but he puts his blessing on it. Now I got a, I got a sack of seed that has God's blessing. It's like that. It's like when you buy seed corn. You bought seed corn before? Anybody ever plant a garden, plant corn in a garden? What color is corn? Nobody knows what color corn is? Yeah. What color is corn? If you go buy corn in the store, yeah. it's yellow. But if you buy seed corn, it's not yellow. It's pink. Because it's been coated with things that protect it. it it's been coated with things that keep the worms from eating it. It's been coated with things that keep it from rotting. It's been protected. Alright? So now you give the tithe to God and he goes to your 90% and he coats it with his blessing. Now the worm can't eat it. And now it ain't going to rot. So now it's going to spring up and it's going to produce much fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Folk. I've planted corn. It's cool because you take one little kernel of corn and you put it in the ground you cover it up and here comes a stalk. Now all of a sudden here comes ears ears and if you open them up it's rows rows of seed and there's multiple ears with multiple rows with multiple seeds some of them we can eat and some of them we can put back in the ground and mm. so when we tie the first 10 percent the blessing comes upon the other 90 and when we put it in the ground, the devourer can't have it. The devourer is rebuked. The canker worm is removed. The birds are shoot away. And blessing and blessing and increase and increase and harvest and harvest comes upon your household. And you can't even stop it. You can't even stop it. Sadly, most people think that people who are givers give because they have a lot. Most people believe when you see somebody who gives big, it's because they have a whole lot. But the truth is, they have a whole lot because they give. I know some big givers, and they have.
have a whole lot. And they're not big givers because they have a whole lot. They were big givers before they had a whole lot. You see what I'm saying? That's why they have a whole lot now. It's because they give and they give and they give. And even now that they have a whole lot, they still give and they still give. It's like Brother Dave was talking about the, the lady with the mites. Jesus, get this picture. Jesus is sitting there next to the offering plate watching what everybody put in. I don't even want to know what they count back there and what goes out at the end of the year that says how much you gave. I don't even want to know that stuff. It doesn't concern me. That's between you and God. I, I am preaching this to get you to give, but not that I can get it because I don't get it anyway. You're not my source. God is my source. So just if you increase your giving, that don't mean I get more money because I'm going to get what I get no matter what. God's going to give me what he wants me to have no matter what. All right, so here's the deal. Jesus is, that just blew me away. He's sitting next to the offering plate, and he's watching what everybody puts in. To me, that would just make me really uncomfortable because it seems like he knows what I have already, and he, he knew that that lady with the mites, she gave, he knew she gave everything. So he obviously had a revelation of what she had. When the wealthy people came, he had a revelation of what they had, and he also saw what they gave. That's why he can make the comparison that he made. So to me, it would be like, oh, he sees what I'm giving and he knows what I have and he knows I could be given more. It's probably how I might feel. <laughs> but is that not truth every time I put my finances in an offering plate? Why is God so concerned with our, our money anyway? Because that's where your heart's at. Where your money is, that's where your heart is. People think that they, they have this mindset. When I have abundance, I'll become a giver. Truth is, you'll never have abundance until you become a giver. Amen. That scripture we just read in 2 Corinthians said, God loves a cheerful giver. Why do you think? Why do you think God loves a cheerful giver? <coughs> because he knows that for there, he must have got a revelation. He must have got a revelation that when he gives, it's given back to him, pressed down, shaken oh. together, and running over I'll call men to give unto his bosom. Yeah. He knows. Oh, yeah. He Why does he love a cheerful giver? Because the only way you're going to be cheerful about giving your money away is if you've got a revelation. Yeah. To walk in the fullness of his blessing, always be asking and listening. Asking, what do I give? And listening for what he tells you. What do I give, Lord? Always be asking. Always be listening. This I'm going to leave this view with this word. Get your finances in order. Get your finances in order. You want God's blessing on your finances? Get them in order. Remember Mike Millay's message when he was here. God will never <laughs> bless a mess. So as long as our finances are a mess, it shows there's no blessing of God there. You want God's blessing in your finances? Get them in order. Get them in order. Look for leaks. Look for areas where you're bleeding. Stop that. Put a plug there. Look for areas of waste. Put a plug there. Be cheerful in knowing that it's true. You can't outgive God. Be cheerful in knowing. God loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because they have a revelation of you can't outgive him. Be cheerful in knowing you can't outgive God, but I want to encourage you to try. I want to encourage you to try. That's the when it comes to finances, that's the only place that I've found that God said, "Try me, try me," because He knew man would be so apprehensive to 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 let go of what He worked so hard for. But He said, "Try me, just try me." And see if I don't throw open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you so big you can't even.